thank you very much for for uh, inviting me to the to the the seminar. Um, so today I, I'm going to be presenting uh, my joint work with uh, Lucie Lebeau um, on central bank digital currencies, uh, financial inclusion versus disintermediation. So the the irony is not lost on me that I, I'm talking about uh, centralized digital currency in a in a DeFi seminar. So you know I, I, I think it's uh, it's it's interesting that. You know, in the last couple of years, the, the 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 discussion on digital currency has migrated from really decentralized token and and crypto towards um, uh, the, the 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 potential central central bank digital currency. Uh, we we started working on the subject at the very beginning of COVID, and at the time, um, discussing about CBDC, uh, central bank digital currency, was uh, very very niche. Uh, actually, I, I, I did have, have a conversation with with Rod in 2020 to to talk about the the beginning of the paper. And he was like, you know, maybe other than ac academic people, nobody really cares about CBDC. Uh, you know, maybe people don't need it. Maybe it's just like this thought experiment that we're having. And and now three years later. Um, we, we went from this sort of niche idea to, um, you know, CBDC don't need introduction anymore. There are actually a lot of, of live projects. Uh, pretty much every central bank, including the Fed, uh, is is doing uh, actual uh, implementable research to, uh, you know, to, 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 to start live projects. So I, I think it's really becoming um, uh, a very topical uh, and relevant uh, subject. So, sorry. So, uh, our angle on, on CBDC is to look at it from the perspective of uh, financial inclusion. And so, you know, financial inclusion is, is still a concern. In emerging economies, obviously, I mean, you know, like, uh, like some emerging countries have half of their population unbanked, so they don't have a bank account, or they all their uh, economic activities are done through uh, paper money or butter or, or things like that. But even in the advanced economy, um, you know, it, it like politicians are, are still concerned with financial inclusion. And actually, a lot of the discussion on CBDC usually mention uh, concern about improving financial inclusion. So the idea that CBDC introducing like a central bank digital currency could help integrate um, some part of the population into uh, uh, digital payments. So they only have uh, you know, paper money to, to, as a form of payment. And so uh, CBDC should, should help. Uh, the, one of the last CBDC project that, that was ro rolled out was uh, by the Bank of Jamaica in, uh, sorry, there's a little typo, in November, 2022. And and during the introduction, so they, that, again, that's a live project. So it's just, it's a it's one of the newest CBDC. And during the the, the speech when they uh, announced the, the the launch, the deputy governor um, really mentioned that Jamdex, which is the name of the the CBDC, uh, is really targeted to help unbanked and underbanked citizen to become part of the formal financial system. So you know, really, it's a it's one of the goal of introducing CBDC for uh, for central banks. Now, one of the big concern is that obviously, if you introduce um, an electronic currency, which has um, which becomes way more comparable to your your bank account, is whether or not it's gonna uh, create disintermediation. So, to what extent introducing CBDC? Is a, a threat to the stability of the of the the banking system, and so the the Federal Re Re Reserve Board uh, that did a report on a potential digital digital dollar last year. So you know to announce the the launch of of increased research on the topic clearly mentioned this this concern. So you know like will there be like some substitution effect? Uh, 
uh, that could reduce uh, the aggregate amount of deposits. So again, like uh, to what extent CBDC could uh, take funding away from banks. So for us, really, that, that was the, the research question. So you're introducing a CBDC. You want this CBDC to uh, be designed in a way that it improves um, financial inclusion. To what extent uh, is that a, a risk for the for the banking sector? Okay. So can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. Like, please interrupt. I mean, again, I, you know, I, I really don't want to be too. Yeah. Familiar. Yeah. So, so in your in your like definition, financial inclusion is not being part of the um, banking system because if if I'm going to hold like a crypto or or sorry a digital a currency um, a CBDC yeah do you kind count it as being part of the economic system or not exactly so and you're gonna see in the in the model obviously once you try to simplify things you you know it, it become a a little bit extreme, but that's exactly what we're doing, right? So we're going to define being financially included as having access to electronic means of payments. And what we're going to say is that um, not every good is accessible for people who only hold cash. And, you know, again, I, th I think it's, 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 it's a reasonable assumption. Uh, and, and I mean, if you're restricted to paper money, clearly, I mean, so you, you have access to the economy, you can buy things, but you won't have access to everything. And, you know, sometimes, so again, if, if you can pay electronically, you can go on Amazon and, and get delivery. If you only get paid in cash, then you have to buy your toothbrush and everything at the shop. There's a cost associated to it. Oh, so okay. for us, really, financial inclusion is the ability. And, and so that's, that's, it's really having access to electronic payments. Okay. So you could you could have said that financial inclusion is like having access to credit. We're not looking at the credit angle. Here, really, the difference between being financially included or not is do you have access to electronic means of payments, which before the introduction of the CBDC is only through uh, a bank account. So I I know that's not necessarily what you meant in your in your question, but. So, for example, we're not going to consider cryptos, right? So, if you if you if you couldn't get a bank account, yeah, and 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 there was like a private token that would allow you to have electronic payments, then you know we would need to introduce a force assets for asset to our model. So here, there's just bank account and cash. If you have a bank account, you're financially included. If you have cash, you're not. Once you have CBDC, if you have CBDC or a bank account you're financially included. And if you still only have cash, you're not. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally makes sense. Okay, now, yeah, so now, it's, now it, it's clear. It's it's a very, yeah, like a narrow definition, but I think it, it, it helps a lot. I and think if you think in the context of EM economy, emerging markets, it, it, it makes a lot of sense, right? So really like you're financially included if the only way you can buy something is you have to walk to the, to the city and and bring some cash and uh, just i think because maybe for some people financial inclusion is not something very you know uh, straightforward so so the, um, maybe you can say something about what are the main reason that we have a financial inclusion like what what is the problem of 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 the users that make them not be yeah, part yeah, of the economy. Uh, if it's more about trust, be, beliefs, something about the 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 behavior of the of the of the users, or it's more about something of the technology, or uh, it's okay. very hard to to open bank account. Like okay, so so here here okay, that's that's really good questions. That that's one of the big assumptions that we're gonna make. So here, the reason you're going to be financially in, uh, excluded, the reason you're not going to have a bank account is because it's too expensive to open a bank account. And when I say too expensive, I mean in the broad term. So it means maybe there's a monetary fee associated. So we don't try to detail. We just say there's, there's a disutility cost 
to open a bank account. It could be monetary. So when you open a bank account, you have to pay like uh, $200 and that's more than what you're willing to pay to have a bank account. It could be that the effort of identifying yourself is, is too much. It could be that, you know, if you're thinking of a emerging country, you're, you're in rural Africa, the cost of having to uh, go to the bank is too high. So you decide not to have a bank account. But it's a, it's a cost. So it's not like trust. If you look at the, um, you know, a lot of the, the survey and research in the U.S. So in the U.S., there's about 5% of the population that's unbanked. Uh, which, you know, in a way, it's not a lot, but still like kind of uh, non-trivial. Half of them are kind of voluntarily unbanked from the sense that, like you said, they don't trust the banks or... So it's not that the cost of having a bank account is too high for them, it's just they don't want to be banked. But the other half will say in the surveys, it's too expensive to open a bank account. And some of the fees that we never see because maybe we have like a sufficiently high, um, you know, uh, like money in your bank account or you, you're using enough services that the bank's going to, you know, wave out the fees. But actually for... Um, you know the 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 less uh, the less wealthy part of the patients sometimes actually they get highest fee when they have to open bank accounts so you know bankers are not really trying to incentivize those people to open bank accounts but yeah to answer the question like long story short we're, we're thinking of the reason why you're unbanked as a fixed cost that you're unwilling to pay to open your bank account amazing thank you and yeah that's going to be like a key driver of the the model um so again, so the, we're going to look at design that will improve financial inclusion. So, you know, broaden the part of the population that uh, will uh, be banked. Again, the, the, the bank versus the unbank are driven by uh, the, the, the amount of wealth. And then we're going to look at the inclusion versus intermediation trade-off. So, you know, either design that can help you uh, mitigate the disintermediation uh, impact uh, that comes from uh, increasing inclusion. Okay, so what, what do we do? So what, what's the, the theory behind? So as I mentioned, and, and we're, we're, we're trying to use a model where money is essential. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, in a way, it sounds obvious. Like, I mean, if you're doing like a money, if you're analyze, analyzing model, money needs to be essential. And somehow, ironically, in 80% of uh, economic models, you know, like Arrow de Bro style environment, you don't need money, right? Like, a, a, like markets are complete and you don't really care about how transaction happens. Usually the way money becomes essential is by introducing a, a friction. So one friction that um, is becoming uh, popular is, you know, the, the search friction. So you're, you're doing like... A, uh, uh, a transaction with someone who doesn't know who you are. It's like a one-on-one -on -one transaction. Uh, you guys, you have something that you want to buy. The seller has something they want to sell. They don't know you. And the only way you can transact is through money until they can get to market where money gets cleared. Here, it's slightly different. Uh, it's based on uh, you know, the, the Simerson model of overlapping generation model, where basically what you're saying is, as, as a young agent, you can produce, but you cannot produce as an old agent. And in order to be able to consume when you're old, you need this kind of token that goes from a generation to the next that allows you from tr transaction. Obviously, that doesn't seem uh, very realistic, but it's very convenient because the, 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 this friction is actually not very different from the fact that I'm making a transaction with you. I cannot barter. So I'm going to need cash. I don't, I'm going to need money. So money is essential. The second, uh, you know, uh, important building block of our uh, theory is that financial inclusion is going to be endogenously determined by income. And basically what it means, and so there's these charts on the right, that's the share of unbanked by income in the US from the FDIC, is that people that are unbanked are also people with the lowest income. So the reason why you will not be 
not have access to a, a bank deposit is because you know you have a low endowment, so you have low income as a young person. You have little wealth. So you only need a little bit of savings, and your amount of savings is too small to justify the investment of paying the fixed cost that's associated with being banked. So that fixed cost, that sort of you know either effort or identification or fee that's associated with opening a bank account, you're not gonna pay for it because you don't have enough savings, okay? And it, it's really good because it, it works, it, it helps matching the data, which, you know, again, people with the lowest amount of savings are the one that's gonna choose to keep cash. Um, banks in the model basically provide intermediation between um, entrepreneurs that need to borrow money and savers, so the young that's going to deposit money uh, to the bank and get their money back when they're when they're old. Okay, so once we've built that model, we're going to introduce CBDC. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, the we're going to define people as financially included if they decide to hold CBDC to to keep their savings. So CBDC is be, is going to be considered as a bank account from the standpoint of being financially included. And you're going to have access to all the goods that you want. So, you know, like a CBDC in terms of financial service is as good as a, as a bank deposit. And there's going to be two design parameters. So one is the fixed cost. So same thing, CBDC, like the bank account, there's going to be a fixed cost to be able to access CBDC, but the fixed cost doesn't need to be the same. It could be lower than the bank account, or it could be higher than the bank account. And we're going to look at the you know, how one versus the other impact the general equilibrium. And then CBDC can pay an interest rate, but it could be a negative interest rate. So we're, we're going to, and we're going to see that actually, even with a slightly, so if interest rates were still at zero, like CBDC could have a negative interest rate and people would still hold CBDC as long as the fixed cost is, is low enough. Okay. So far, so good. So, so two questions. First, um, just for curiosity, we observe the same uh, distribution also in um, Africa and For other sure. countries. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, you know, yeah. So, <clears throat> and it's funny because I mean that's one of my my like at the at the end one one of the, I mean one of the follow up paper I, I think we should write with Lucy is uh is really like a proper calibration with a, an EM country maybe in Africa or maybe in Latin America um, or maybe in India like India has a lot of interesting data um, so I mean people that don't have uh, most of the unbanks are in rural Africa which also happen to be poor people. So, I mean, they, they can be like a, you know, like a, you know, a, a factor that both drives the fact that they're poor and that they're unbanked, but clearly the correlation is very strong. Um, yeah. But I think it kind of works like, you know, you're in rural Africa, again, you don't need as much savings because you don't have a lot of money. Do you want to really go to the bank? Probably not. So actually one, one way to do the model that could be interesting is just like a, you know, like those microeconomics model where, where your distance to the bank would be the fixed cost. <laughs> and then I think people would be very happy. So, you know, people, like economists, when you say fixed cost, they get a little bit like, oh, how do you justify the fixed cost? Can you make it endogenous? So one way to make it like nicely exogenous and not too debatable would be, okay, let's do a model based on the distance to the bank and based on your savings, you're going to go to the bank or not. That Then everybody's going to be happy. So I think that's one way to uh, think of it. And Go just to, like to make sure, so so in in this model, the idea is that the reason why you want to um um to hold like digital currency um or open a bank, it's because it's the only way that you can consume in the when you become old. So no, so you could use cash, right? So you could use paper money. So the only way to, to consume as an old person is either cash. CBDC or a bank deposits, but CBDC and bank deposits have a benefit that as, as, as you're old, you can consume all the goods. 
So you can buy something on Amazon or you can go to the shop or you can okay. pay Netflix. Okay. Okay. If you only have cash, you can only buy like, you know, the things I that see. you can buy cash. And so the I cash see. is inferior from that standpoint. I see. I see. I see your point. Okay. Which again, I think it's kind of true. I mean, like, you know, I mean, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, for us, it's so, different because so, we have a little bit of cash and, and, but we pay most of our things electronically because it's safer, it's nicer, it's, it's more convenient. I mean, cash so so the, the idea is if I am in my first generation doing a lot of money in cash and in when I become old, if I still hold cash, I'm going to only use it to buy things in the supermarket. But right. unfortunately, it's not going to allow me to buy things in Amazon. So it's going to have a right. bad impact on my utility. Exactly. 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 Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. All right. So... I think I'm, I'm going to accelerate a little bit, but very quickly. So, I mean, uh, so our paper, you know, in the context of, of the CBDC uh, and, and disintermediation uh, literature is very comparable to three other paper, Kaiser Sanchez, Chu, and, and Adolfato. And here I kind of summarize the, you know, the, the difference in terms of um, characteristic of the model and, and outcome. And, I think the, the one thing where our paper adds to the literature, so Andolfato is the only other paper where the demand for money is income driven. So again, I think for us, because we want to look at uh, the question of financial inclusion, you want to have income heterogeneity and you want the income heterogeneity to drive, you know, again, that to re represent that stylized fact to, to drive your demand for money. So I think that's one way we, our, our, our paper is, is different in the literature. And we're also the first paper, ironically, where in, in the equilibrium, you're going to have cash, CBDC, and bank deposits. All the other paper, usually what happens is you introduce CBDC, but CBDC and deposits are the, exactly the same. They're perfect substitutes. So in equilibrium, you, you're always going to get either deposits or then the bank di disappear. And you know, for me, it's not very realistic because I don't see the central bank introducing CBDC. And then the bank adjusts to this new competition and nobody's going to hold CBDC because if nobody holds CBDC, I mean, why would you pay for the infrastructure? It, I don't think CBDC can be a credible outside option to the banking sector. It needs to be adopted. And that's one thing that the paper does well, where the CBDC is going to be adopted in equilibrium, but the bank will live in, in you know, as a, as a, as a extra assets. So they're not perfect substitutes. So I think that's one, um, you know, relevant addition to, uh, to our paper. Okay, so what do we find? Um, so first, there, there's a level of minimum return on the CBDC that needs to uh, be reached to, to be adopted. And again, it, it could be minus 3% return. But, you know, if you introduce a CBDC that has like a minus 10% nominal return, people will only use cash and, and, and deposits. So that's one that I don't think that's a big, you know, I don't think that's a very uh, shocking result, but that's an important result. So we can come with the actual level at which the CBDC start to have an impact on the general equilibrium. Then I think the, the more interesting uh, results is we find those two channels. So if you introduce like a, a CBDC with a low fixed cost, then people are gonna move from paper money into CBDC. If you have a high fixed cost, actually you're gonna uh, put pressure on, on the, 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 the banking sector more, but you could still get uh, some financial inclusion. Then I think one of the big punchline of the, the paper and I mean, as usual, it, it depends on the, the, the hypothesis that we picked, but we can get situation where you can increase financial inclusion without getting uh, disintermediation. Actually, you can even get like under specific circumstances, an introduction of the CBDC where you're gonna get higher inclusion and a larger banking sector. And the, the reason is if the banking sector is very concentrated and not very competitive because you're introducing some competition, the bank is going to be forced to be more competitive and actually might start to get uh, 
larger deposits. So you know it's kind of interesting that in a, in a it's easier to justify interesting CBDC in a very concentrated uh, banking uh, market. And then the, the last thing, uh, the last uh, conclusion is we think that introducing a CBDC with a low fixed cost, uh, but also low interest rates will be uh, the, the, the best way to get like large impact on uh, inclusion without too much disintermediation. So the low fixed cost is having a big impact on inclusion. The interest rate actually is, is, is having a bigger impact on, on the bank competition. So as long as you keep the interest rates pretty low, but the low fixed cost, it looks a little bit more like, like paper money. And so that way you would, uh, you know, you would mitigate the, the impact on the, the disintermediation. Okay, so <clears throat> yeah, it's a very long introduction and then, but I think the introduction is a little bit more interesting for you guys than, you know, the, 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 the theory. So, you know, I'm, I'm, taking, I'm taking my time for now. Uh, we, we do a calibration exercise. So this is the detail of the calibration. So we look at the distribution of income. We use the US. Uh, we look at um, demand for deposits and the uh, concentration in the banking sector. And then we're going to, the experiment is to introduce different types of CBDCs with different level of fixed costs and look at um, the impact on competition and disintermediation. So then we can really like uh, look at the trade off that we are trying to analyze. And so, you know, again, like, like really big results. Uh, if the CBDC is 50% cheaper than deposits. And so what, what we mean by this, let's say the, the cost of uh, opening a, a bank deposit is, is $1,000 per year. I think, I think the calibration shows like something around close to $650, uh, top of my mind. If you introduce a CBDC that's half that, so let's say $500, then you would reduce the unbanked population by 93% in the US. So, I mean, you would almost get rid of of unbanked people. So that's a really big impact. Even with a CBDC that's only 10% cheaper, you're already, already reducing the, the unbanked uh, population by 80%. So you don't need a CBDC that's a lot cheaper to have a big impact. And so we, we compare it to like perfect competition. So clearly, you know, the, the banking sector in the US is, is not uh, perfectly competitive. Uh, so that creates some, um, restriction to, to bank access. If the, the, the banking sector was perfectly competitive, we would only reduce unbanked population by 50%. So you can see that CBDC has a much stronger impact on um, the financial inclusion that even like really aggressive, um, you know, uh, an aggressive increase of the size of the, the banking sector. So I thought that was kind of a, an interesting result. Okay, so let's let's get into the so model. I have a question. Yeah. When you yeah, say go on. Che cheaper than deposits, so what is now the cost of opening a bank account? So it's, it's, it's so I mean the the short answer is we we can't observe the cost right because it part of it is subjective and part of it is but when we do the calibration. I think, I, I don't know if I have the number later in the presentation, but what I remember is like, it's around $600 of, of that fixed cost to open a bank account. I see. Equivalent okay. of $600. So again, maybe it's a $100 fee and the fact that the disutility of, you know, having to go to the DMV, get an ID, uh, then showing the ID to the bank account, signing all the paper, the three hours that you're going to spend at the bank, uh, is equivalent to five hundred dollars, right? It doesn't need to be like a, a monetary fee, but the based on the calibration, yeah, I think it's around six hundred dollars. I see. So, so, so in in like in sense of like practical, if you create a CBDC, so the the way that you can make it be cheaper, it's just like if you make it be online, you don't need right. so much documents. You right. just like get it right away. So, I mean, <clears throat> so that's not something we're going to explore in the paper because, you know, it's a theoretical paper. So we're just saying, look, as long as it's 50% cheaper, this is what you get. 
but I think if you had to put like a story behind it, um, you know, so there's a few ideas that have been, uh, you know, floated. One is you could use the, the, the postal office. There's not, you know, like the, the, the post is, is somehow, you know, it's easy to go to the post. There's a lot of post office in the US. They usually know where you live, et cetera, et cetera. So you could say, okay, the post office is gonna create those uh, Fed bank account. And, you know, maybe there's a subsidy from the government on top of it, but we already have the, you know, the, the network. So you don't have to build the network. And then we can make like kind of cheap, easy to access bank account. One way also would be you have a social security number with the government or you are identified by the DMV and with your DMV identification, this gives you access to that uh, Fed bank account, that Fed deposit account. Uh, I think, you know, the, 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 there was a lot of interesting um, discussion around this when they did the, you know, the, the, the checks for the COVID, you know, when they, they send the checks. So they use their, 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 their if, you, if you had an IRS number, which most of us do, and you're, you, you had like, a, you know, you register with the IRS, then they would send money to your bank account. But you could think like, okay, maybe the IRS creates like a, like a sort of a Fed direct account, and this would be your CBDC. So, you know, those are kind of the idea. It, it could be like online, it could be, you know, in Africa, uh, the, the mobile phone companies have become almost like banks where one mobile number associated with like a microchip, you know, allows you to like, like, like sort of electronic money. So that could be like another form of technology that might be easier to access. Um, you know, clearly if, again, and that's, that's hard because it, it creates other issues and there's a few papers about that that are interesting, but if the CBDC is anonymous, so if you create like a, a kind of a crypto style technology where, you know, you're quasi anonymous and you have your private key and then you can transfer money, it, it, it might be easier, right? Because some people, for some people, the cost is really about identifying yourself. And so that quasi anonymity makes it more like easier to, you know, open like a, a wallet. So that could be another way to think of it. Great, thanks. Okay, so <clears throat> now let's get to the let's get to the model. <clears throat> um, so time goes from one to infinity. It's an overlapping generation model. So every period, there's a new generation of young that's born, and 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 you know from a generation to the next, the 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 young become old. Uh, there's three types of agents, workers, bankers, and investors. The workers are endowed YI. So my parameter Y here is very important because that's what's driving my heterogeneity of income. Uh, so why is how much you know, goods you get or labor capacity? I mean, you can think in different ways. At birth, as a young. So each worker gets a, a yi that's distributed based on the 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 cdf um theta so you know it could be normally distributed it could be uniform there's a support there's a probability distribution to your endowment so if your yi is very low it means you're poor if your yi is very high then you're a, a wealthy um a wealthy worker and you're trying to optimize your utility over two periods, one and two. Uh, it's a quasi-linear uh, utility function. And C2 is your consumption when you're old. And C1 is your consumption as, as a young. There is no storage technology. So your endowment as a young, you really want to transfer it to your second period. So that's your friction. Uh, and the way you do it will be through um, either through money or deposits or eventually uh, CBDC. Uh, investors, they need to borrow and then they, they produce. So they, they create that kind of supply of, uh, of, uh, of, 
capital and they create the so they go to the bank the, the only way investors can get um capital they, they don't have endowment like the workers they need to go to the bank they borrow money from the bank they invest in their technology they get like a positive return in the second period they're going to reimburse the bank and then the bank can pay a little bit of a return on deposits so the bank basically the the reason they can do this uh, transfer uh, service is they're, they're the only one who can commit and enforce uh, payments. So they can credibly say, if I take your money today, I will reimburse you tomorrow. And, and if you borrow from them and you don't uh, pay them back, they can, they, can, they can recollect. Now, that's so why is my uh, wealth distribution? That's the first important parameter of my model. The second one, <clears throat> is there's this gamma D, um, which is my fixed cost, right? So that's the effort of, um, that's that's the effort to open my bank account. So it's applied to the second period, but it, it doesn't really matter, right? But that's really that fixed cost that we've talked about. So, you know, in Africa, it's the distance to the bank. In the US, maybe it's the fees, but it's, it's your fixed cost. And that's really the CBDC will compete by, having a, a gamma that's either lower, which then is, is, is cheaper or higher, but then they have to provide like a higher return on, uh, on capital. Okay, so now the, and that's the key driver of, of my model. So that, I mean, that's, that's kind of a, an important thing. So money demand is gonna be driven by, um, you know, the, the worker uh, optimization problem. And so basically the worker has to choose between the two assets that's available to them, cash. And cash return is going to be uh, RC, which is basically in like the opposite of inflation. So if inflation is 10%, RC is, is 0.9, right? So that's the, the, the real return on cash or the, the bank deposits. And so the, the bank deposit is your RD. And so obviously if RD was less than RC, why am I gonna pay like a fixed cost to uh, you know, get a bank deposit? So I, I'm, I'm not gonna consider uh, deposits, but as the return on deposits increase, then, then households gonna move, move towards deposits. And so this, this, this line is, the level of wealth that's going to make you choose bank deposits for given return on uh, deposits versus the return on cash. So again, so let's say this is 0 0.9 because there's 10% inflation. Let's say maybe this is zero, so that would be one. Then when with a, a, a real return of one on bank deposits, all the households with wealth above this, so all the households on above the, the line will choose bank deposits. All the households below the line will choose cash. Okay, clear-ish. So for a given level of... Based on that fixed cost, all the households above a certain to put their saving into bank deposits all the households below will use cash and so now <clears throat> we can actually using the first order conditions etc we can then have like an aggregate demand for cash and an aggregate demand for deposits again in an economy where so far we don't have cbdc is the intuition of the chart kind of clear or or not you can say no I'm going to take clear. it as it is. Okay. I think it's clear. Yeah. Okay. So now <clears throat> that we have this, we can define, you know, again, going back to, to your question like earlier, uh, near. So now that we have, you know, this, um, you know, this, this sort of frontier of, of wealth level where you go from fiat to uh, deposits. So for a given, um, rate of return on deposits, the Y tilde 
defines the wealth level at which you're going to use uh, bank accounts. The blue line above are people that are financially included and people below are the ones that are excluded. So now we have our definition of financial inclusion. So now we have two key ingredients for a model. Demand for money that's driven by heterogeneous, heterogeneous income. And we have our definition of financial inclusion. Okay. And then the financial intermediation. For now, we're going to assume that the, 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 um, the banking sector is competitive. So all the deposits are invested into a loan. And so the, the, the intermediation is actually equal to the aggregate demand for money as well, for deposits. This, this is going to be relaxed in the non-competitive uh, market. So in, in the calibration, that's, that's not true anymore. Okay, so now, so, and, and that's why, you know, when I mentioned like, we could have done the, the model in partial equilibrium. So far, everything we've talked about is partial equilibrium, right? It's really like, what is the demand for money? So now what we're going to do is like, now that we understand the, the driver of our money in demand, we're going to introduce the CBDC. So CBDC issued by the central bank. And so now you have a new fixed cost, which is the gamma E and an interest rate. So those are the two important factors. So I'm going to use only one case, but you know, in the paper, we, we've looked at both cases. So when, um, what have I done? So when uh, gamma E, so the fixed cost is lower than um, the, the fixed cost of the deposits, when you introduce your um, CBDC for a given return. So here is your equilibrium before. Right, so you had like a rate of return on on deposits. All those people were uh, holding cash. All those people were holding deposits. You're introducing this new um, CBDC, and so this is the indifference level between cash and the CBDC, which we chose to be lower. Otherwise, you have no impact on the general equilibrium. And so before you know, the market adjusts, all this, all this part of the population, so all the people with income between Y star and uh, this level of, of um, Y hat, they would choose CBDC. And so the bank would lose all these, uh, you know, the difference between the orange line and the black line is the people that would leave the bank to adopt CBDC. So that's the disintermediation. And this is the financial inclusion, the people that leave cash into CBDC. Obviously, the bank is going to respond. They're going to raise interest rates. And then the general equilibrium is going to migrate toward a higher rate of return on deposit. And that's going to mitigate the disintermediation. So here in our example, you can see that the same level of wealth is going to be indifferent between CBDC and deposits. And so that's how you would get this increased financial inclusion, but somehow limited uh, disintermediation. So now that's the key driver of the, the model. Um, I think in the interest of time, you know, so I'm not going to detail all the other sub cases of, uh, of, of the dynamic, but once you have this dynamic, then you can really kind of go to the results. So let me jump around. So this would have been the case of a higher cost. The mechanism are going to be different, but again, I don't think it's necessary for you guys to understand the, the takeaways to go through all of them. So I'm going to skip that. And so here, now we're starting to see the, you know, the, the results. So, Once you consider the, the, the CBDC equilibrium, the, the first thing that's really clear is if you increase the rate of return on the CBDC, so like kind of, you know, statics, comparative statics, if you increase the rate of return on, on, on CBDC, or if you decrease the fixed cost, the effect is very straight, right? It's like increased financial inclusion and decreased uh, intermediation, right? So you make the CBDC more competitive, more people are going to adopt electronic payments, but the, the, the bank's gonna suffer. 
when the deposit is lower, it, it drags people from cash. Again, when it's higher, it, 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 it comes from the bank. Now, I think the one thing that is interesting, actually, let me skip straight to this, is when you have a low fixed cost, so you have a low fixed cost, rate of return on cash to get the same amount of deposit stays the same. What the model allows us to do is you can calibrate for a given level on the fixed cost, how much you should pay, and it could be a negative interest rate again, on CBDC to make sure that all the disintermediation that was generated by the low fixed cost is entirely mitigated by offering a low rate of return. So that's, you know, that's, um, that's kind of the way we're going to use the model to, um, to look at the results. Okay, so, I mean, this is a recap. Now, there's a couple of extensions. I'm just going to explain the ideas and I'm not going to get into the details. So the first one is, uh, introducing imperfect competition in the deposit market. So basically all you're saying is there's a limited amount of bank. So they, they're not going to give the competitive RD rate of return on deposits. You know, they're going to create a rent. And this is one of the, the addition to the calibration. So, I mean, this is in other papers. So I don't think it's very uh, important to explain. Then the second element of, uh, that we've added to the model, to the baseline model, is this imperfect accessibility of cash. And so this, I, I'd like to talk just two, three minutes about it because I think it's, you know, it's kind of an interesting idea for, for the topic because you know, it, it also is true for crypto. So basically the idea is to say, there's a basket of good, there's like a continuum variety of goods between zero and one. And agent is gonna consume like a bundle of, all those goods, you know, so, you know, and there's this substitution elasticity of the goods. So ideally a, a consumer would like to consume as many goods as possible. And, you know, they're going to substitute if one good is unavailable or one good is a little too expensive. And then this create your uh, aggregate uh, goods. So this could be like the GDP. This is all the, you know, all the things that you can buy. And you go, if you go from zero to one, it means like, 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 like I said, you can buy things on Amazon and you can buy like, you know, fruits at the shops and everything. Okay. And to, to maximize your utility, you want to consume as much as possible. So you like variety, but then we're going to make this assumption that from alpha to one. So there's a part of the basket above alpha. Uh, and I think the alpha, I mean, I, I've got the alpha in the calibration. Uh, I think it's around 10%, uh, top of my mind. Everything above alpha, you can only buy it with digital money. So that's how you make, you know, from the model standpoint, that's how you got that notion of the cash money, the paper money is inferior to the digital money because it doesn't allow you to buy all the goods. So that's how it's formalized. And so here it's the basket. So instead of integrating on the whole, uh, basket from zero to one here you're integrating from zero to alpha and so what we'd find out is the return is you know is is multiplied by alpha uh, to the power of um, you know the invert of the elasticity and that number is less than one so you know again it, it reflects the fact that the return on your uh, balances when you use cash is is discounted by this number that's less than one. And so same thing, that's how we can get like a negative interest rate on the CBDC. Okay, so now let's look at the quantitative exercise. Um, so this is the detail of the calibration. So we introduced like a CRA utility. Uh, so, you know, we're gonna use a calibration for Sigma. The production function is Cobb Douglas. Okay, so that's more important because that's really specific to this uh, calibration. So we're going to use a log normal distribution 
for the indomum. So that's your wealth, right? So how, how, how rich people are, we're going to use like a medium income and then a log normal distribution with like a dispersion of, of sigma, which again, so we're going to use like, a, you know, actual data. Because it's log normal, basically the one little thing that we uh, kind of ignore versus the reality is like the hyper wealthy people. So Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos would not be part of our distribution. They don't exist. But again, I don't think they have a big impact on the equilibrium and that's not the, what we're interested in too. So we thought that was a, a nice way to keep the, the parameters simple. Okay, so those are the, the data that we use. So we use M1, uh, so, you know, aggregate demand for money. We use like uh, deposit rates before 2007 because, you know, after the, the after rate uh, with the zero lower bound, it, it, it became kind of more complicated to, uh, to calibrate. And then we use the, the share of unbanked households in the US. Okay, so now that gives you all the numbers. So for example, uh, alpha actually no, is, 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 is 75%. So it's, 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 it's uh, even lower than I thought. So 25% of the basket of goods uh, cannot be uh, consumed without uh, um, digital currency. And actually now I can also answer your question and, and my memory was bad. So the calibration, the, so the result we get for the fixed cost of opening a bank account is $120. So it's, it's lower than, than I thought. So basically you go from $120 to like 60, that would be your 50% uh, discount. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. yeah now, totally. now, now, now I'm almost done. So let me just jump straight to the, the big punchline. So now that we've done all this calibration, Basically, we can we can get the we can look at the experiment, and so the experiment is literally you're starting from this point. So here, there's no. So this is where you're starting from, right? How much bank, how much deposit you're you're holding, and and the 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 population that's that's unbanked, and so as you go up, you're reducing the bank population so the, the the more you could do is like six and a half percent and then there, there would be zero unbanked in the us when you go to the right here what you're doing is actually you're increasing bank deposits and so again that's that's you know the one thing that's kind of interesting is so here is the case of introducing a, a cbdc that's 50 percent cheaper so 60 dollars of fixed cost and then you can see based on the how low um, uh, a rate of return you're gonna use. First, you increase the little bit intermediation. So you could argue that this is maybe the optimal point, right? So here you, re you, you reduce your um, unbanked population in half, right? So you go from, you by, by increasing the, the bank population by 3%, it's half of the unbanked that are gone. And you have a little bit of increased intermediation. So, you know, I think the idea is like, now I, I'm at the Fed, I get to pick my point. So we, we were suggesting like, so if you can introduce a CBDC that's 50% cheaper, you can increase the population of banked household by 6%. So you've almost reduced the entire unbanked population with zero impact on intermediation based on this calibration. So here you could say like, okay, so maybe I can only do this. So I can only do this. So I can like my possibility frontier is this, uh, this line. And then as a policy maker, you're gonna get to pick the point of the line. So, you know, that's what the model really uh, allows you to do. Here for the US, but you could, you could do it for uh, other, um, other countries. So, yeah, so to conclude, um, and you know, what else should we look at? So I think one thing that could be interesting to add to the experiment is maybe like a cap on CBDC. So again, if you're really concerned by disintermediation and you're looking at, uh, you know, increasing savings for the unbanked, you know, the unbanked don't have a lot of savings, so you could have that caps on CBDC. So that would be one way to also, uh, uh, 
look into the model. I think one potential interesting research question as a follow-up is, could you use CBDC, you know, as a tool of financial repression? So, you know, one problem of, um, you know, Western World Central Bank is because the demand for cash paper is decreasing, the seniorage that you get from the cash is, is going down. But one way to reduce uh, public debt might be to introduce a CBDC that's pretty attractive, but that would have like a negative interest rate, nominal interest rate. Um, and then I think one, one, one really interesting follow-up question for us would be to you know, apply the calibration to uh, emerging market economy, you know, so like Peru or, or, um, or India. And yeah, I think that's, that's it.